Welcome to Hacker News Weekly Roundup. I'm Nicholas Ung, one of Hacker News editors, and today I'll be going over the five best articles of the week. Over the last few days, we've received articles about what blockchain means for the environment, what cryptocurrency might look like after the crash we've just experienced, and even what kind of life might live inside the blockchain. We've also had articles talking about what edge computing actually is, which is something I've never heard of before, and even the sorts of data that companies can gather on you and what that might mean in the future, which might be a well-spoken but overly covered topic, but we did have an interesting take about it this week, which is why it's on the list. So, on to our first article. Climate change is something that's on our minds right now. I would know. I was in a blazer, tie, and graduation gown when London hit 40 Celsius. I did not enjoy it. But what people also think about is the impact the impact that Bitcoin and the blockchain in general might have on the environment, because it's something that's been covered a lot. The old system of proof to work has been one of Bitcoin's most contentious topics and has been something that detractors speak of a lot, and for good reason. The climate is not going to get any better as much as we all wish it would. So this article written by DK considers that very problem. DK talks about the very real consequences of the old proof-of-work system. It, with the very real consequence being that Bitcoin uses more electricity than the entire nation of Argentina, which is 46 million people. It wades into a well-rehearsed argument about Bitcoin's utility over its environmental impact at a time when that impact is most keenly felt. DK explains exactly how this system came to be and why it was useful at the start, and why in an ideal world this wouldn't actually be a problem. It only became a problem when people decided to make really big mining farms and it drove up the complexity which then drove up the electricity needed to proof of work one Bitcoin and one transaction. They also remind us that Bitcoin is not the only cryptocurrency, though it is um, the most prevalent. Ethereum, for example, is a competitor that has that is far less energy intensive than Bitcoin per transaction and it's also home to proof of stake, an alternative to proof of work that has a lower energy impact. The article goes into far more detail than I did, but I'm sure that you'll find it worth reading. While on the topic of cryptocurrencies, our next story is one by Modern Emirate. It takes a positive look on the crypto winter, which might seem catastrophic because, you know. His article looks at the crypto winter through the lens of the question, is the crypto market the same as it was in the last crash. And spoiler alert, it isn't. The market has grown and matured, and while the crypto winter is a really serious problem with values of everything dropping, it also brought in new investors with more cash and new developers with new ideas. Modern Emright goes a step further and says that crypto regulation puts the industry in a better position than it would be otherwise. While a lack of regulation with anonymity and separation from states which may or may not have a fantastic track record of running economies in the the modern day and age and when you want to have mass adoption that is not something you would want. If you have more regulation you then receive a degree of legitimacy and thus safety, something that the market needs needs to have in order to grow. The same can be said for stable coins and the ability to translate real life assets like fiat currency into cryptocurrency and vice versa. They say, and I quote, stable coins become, might become the backbone of the industry. And that is just a small part of it. The rest of the article goes into much more dynamic and interesting topics like how new uses of Web3 might drive up adoption and what those uses might be, as well as how Web3 might change things for the crypto market. Either way, it's a refreshing take that absolutely belongs on our front page. Our last crypto and blockchain-based story is a somewhat terrifying thought experiment. It's written by a user called Officer CIA, and I really hope that is a joke. But Officer CIA asks if life can grow in the blockchain, and what that life might be, while likening that life to the hypothetical entity Laplace's demon, which is more of a thought experiment, but also something you see a lot in fiction. The question might seem absurd, and the reaction is well warranted. But as we've seen in the last two articles, what constitutes the blockchain is always expanding. Where there was just Bitcoin, then there then was Solana, Ethereum, other competitors, shit coins, doge coins, and so much more than that. And then you get into decentralized apps and smart contracts. 
Imagine if, a few years down the line, they get far more complex, the same way the stock market is driven by algorithms the ordinary person can't comprehend and yet print loads of money. What if smart contracts and decentralized apps go down the same route? And then when they start talking to each other and become more advanced based on those interactions, what comes out of that? That's what Officer CIA asks. It has a lot of ver- um, a lot of case studies and research that would back this up. Things like how chatbots have developed a form of sentience in interacting with each other. While the article is well researched and interesting, it is also important to remember that it is hypothetical. And the rest of it goes into more of those hypothetical situations. Questions like, why this hypothetical Laplace's demon? That'll be purely logical. And why it might not evolve into Skynet the way we imagine. And it's well worth a read. Our fourth article is written by Oliver Hale, CEO of the company Travalo, a new startup. He pulled data that a bunch of big companies have on him, companies like Facebook, Google, and Apple, and pulled them together thanks to uh, Article 15 of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, legislation that's found in the EU. All of his highlights, all of his highlights are really interesting, and I was very amused by them. For example, this absolute beast of the man, since November 2015, climbed up 44,471 flights of stairs, which is equivalent to 161 and a half Burj Khalifas, which is the tallest building in the world. And he also walked the distance from Cardiff in the United Kingdom, Wales, to Queensland, Australia, which you would ordinarily need to be Jesus to do. But, well, he did it since 2015, so it makes sense. What he wanted to draw attention to was not the fact that companies can gather this data. Because we know that they can, we've known about it for a very long time, but what he wants to draw attention to is that the data sets that they can gather might not be the sorts of things that we might expect from them. That they might be interesting and useful and that companies can discover things about us that we don't even know about ourselves, for example. He also wants to draw attention to the fact that the GDPR, like legislation like the GDPR, can be used to safely and ethically gather that data that can be used to genuinely improve our lives, if we trust governments to do it. Our final article is on edge computing, and it was written by Fong Nguyen. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. To be perfectly honest, this is not what I imagine when someone talks about edge computing. As he explains, edge computing is a new place to run code that exists between server-side and client-side hosting. Because of how it's hosted, it's quicker to implement than server-side hosting, which can require server downtime, and it's also more stable and less disruptive than client-side hosting. An example given is how it can work with A-B testing, for example. If the idea appeals to you, you can read the article to find out more, because I'm really not qualified to go into too much detail about this, and I might have gotten some words wrong. Please don't shoot me. But the general premise is there, and I hope you find it as interesting as I did. So that wraps up Hacker Noon's weekly roundup. I hope you enjoyed the selection of articles this week, I ho- and thanks for sticking by and watching the second one, if you made it to the end. As always, if you want to read more, you can always go to our site at hackernoon.com, obviously. And if you want to have your own article up on here, just write a really, really good one, and we'll see if we'll make it a top story, and then we'll see if we'll put it in this video, because we get about 30 a week, 30 top stories a week, that is, we get over 500 articles a week. So picking is kind of difficult. But either way, I hope you enjoy it, and um, see you next week.